the tidyverse has fantastic functions to help you clean up your data smooth and efficiently and in today's video i'm going to show you the six fundamental building blocks that you will need regardless of what kind of data you want to clean up in my quarter file i've already set up a code chunk that loads the tidyverse but clearly we also need data so let us load our favorite penguins dataset from the Parma penguins dataset. We could of course load this package like we loaded the tidyverse, but since we only want to get the penguins data, we can just call that package directly, use the double colon notation to access that package, and then get the penguins dataset from there. And if you execute all of that, you will see that we have our data. Since this is kind of a long name, let us save this into a variable name, let us call this penguins. And that way we can always look at our data set by just typing out that name and calling that variable. So the first data cleaning essential that I want to show you is the count function. All you have to do is to take your data set like our penguins data set and then pass it to the count function and that way you will get counts. Obviously this isn't a particularly nice output right now because it just shows us how many rows are in our data sets, how many penguins are there. That is why you can specify what things you want to count by naming a column from the data set and here we could just throw in the species and that way we get a count of how many different penguins of what kind of species are inside of the data set. And the nice thing about this count function is that it also has a sort argument so that you can sort the output from largest to lowest count. And even better if you want to count multiple combinations from different columns you can just list all of the columns that you want to count and then it will count all of the combinations for you. And you might think count isn't particularly useful for data cleaning, but really this function is a neat helper that you can use in between to check after a data cleaning operation that you performed if the counts later match what you think it should. And after I have performed some cleaning operation, I use the count function to check how things changed. And this helps me to do some kind of sanity checks to make sure that my data cleaning doesn't do something I don't want it to do. Next, let us talk about the select function that helps you select columns from a data set. That way you can focus on a particular subset of your data. So let's create a new code chunk so that I can show you how this function works. All we have to do is to take our data set, we can look at it in full width, and then we can pass this data set to the select function. And in there, we can specify the column names from the list of columns that we see and select columns that way. So here we might choose to get the flipper length, the bill length, and the species. And that way we have only those columns inside of our result. So that's kind of easy and it doesn't get much harder than that with the select function. I do want to point out though that there are a couple of advanced tricks that you can use with select. For example, if you wanted to get all but one column, you could just remove all the columns that you want. So let's just imagine that we want to get all but the flipper length column. Then you can just add a minus in front of that and that way you get all but this column. Or if you look at your original data set, you might be inclined to get a couple of columns that are right next to each other. For example, you want to get these three columns, everything from bill length millimeters to flipper length or maybe even to body mass in gram. Then you could do the same thing with select, but this time you specify only the start and the end column. So here we take the bill length, throw in the colon and then use the body mass gram name. And that way we get all of the columns between bill length and body mass. These extra tricks are what is known as tidy select helpers. And there are a couple of more that do even more advanced stuff. But here I want to keep this video short and concise and beginner friendly. So that is why all of the advanced tricks aren't covered here. If you are interested in that, feel free to check out my advanced data cleaning course. But for now, let us move on to the other essentials for data cleaning. The next thing that I want to cover is the filter function. This one is absolutely crucial because it helps you to reduce your data to the observations that you're actually interested in. So let us create a new code chunk and in there we can take our data set and pass it to filter. Basically filter works like select but for rows. While select selects a couple of rows that you're interested in, the filter function will help you get the rows that you're interested in. For example, you might be interested in particular observations with respect to the bill length. If that is the case, you can just take the bill length column and then put in a condition like larger than 55. So basically if we execute this, we see that we get a result with five rows 
and all of these five penguins have in common that their bill length is larger than 55. Similarly, if you wanted to make this even more precise, if you don't want to have only larger than 55, but between 55 and some other number, you could do the exact same thing. That is, you take your data set, pass it to the filter function, and now inside of the filter function, you have to use the between function where you stick in the bill length and then pass the lower and the upper bound that you want for the bill lengths into this. And that way you get all of the penguins where the bill length is between 55 and 58. Now you might be wondering how to read this kind of thing and what kind of syntax is needed here to make this work. While this bill length larger than 55 feels pretty human readable, you might be wondering why the syntax or the code is like that. So it is worth to ponder on what filter does behind the scenes. And once you understand that, then you will also understand why this here is perfectly good code and does exactly what you want. Let me just make some room here. And then in that code chunk, let us just try to figure out what filter does behind the scenes. First thing, if you want to access the data like the bill length, you can just call it without anything because then R will simply not know where this bill length millimeter is coming from. The nice thing about the select and filter function and all the other things from the tidyverse is that it always checks whether the names that we use are available as column names inside of the data set. But if you want to access the same column from outside of one of these tidyverse function, then you will have to tell R where this column can be found. And this is why you use the variable name where the data is stored in and use the dollar sign to tell R to get the bill length from the penguins data set. And once you execute this, you see that you get a vector full of numbers or sometimes even missing values. So that's how you can access data from your data set. And now what filter does when it has some operation like this here is that it simply takes this vector full of data and applies the operation that you specified. And the operation here was to just do larger than 55. And if you execute that, then you see that you get a vector full of trues and false. Since at the end of the day, we only got five rows back, it is only natural that we have a whole lot of falses, but there are also a couple of trues here. And also where there was a missing value, there is still a missing value after the operation. So really what filter does is when it evaluates something like this, is that it performs this operation just like we did manually. And then it will give you back the rows where we had the couple of trues. And if you wanted to simulate this kind of workflow to figure out what are the rows that we get back, you could use the which function that does exactly what you guess. It tells you which of the values are true. So that's how you can understand how the filter function does its thing. And this is also how you can then understand why this is perfectly good code. If we copy this part here and move this into the remainder of the code chunk, then we could not really access the data right now because we still have to tell R to use the penguins data. So if we throw this in there and then execute this code, then we see that at the end of the day, between is a function that returns trues and falses. And this is exactly what the filter function needs. So sometimes you have a really simple operation that gives you all of the trues and falses that you need. That's just like with this setting larger than 55. But sometimes you have some intermediate function that you have to first execute to get the trues and falses so that filter can do its thing. So here I hope this gives you a kind of behind the scenes of what filter does and why this code looks the way it does. All right, let us move on to the next fundamental function and that is mutate. This function is great for creating new or modifying existing columns. So let's try out what it can do in a new code chunk and we're going to take our data and then we're going to pass this to mutate. And inside of mutate, we can then specify what column we want to target. For example, we want to target the bill length column, and this would override what is inside of the bill length column. If this name here that you put in there isn't an, an already existing column name, then mutate would create this column for you. But since bill length millimeters already exist, you will simply override this column. And then what you assign to this column name will be what you put into this column. So this means that after this equal sign, you can put in any operation that you want, as long as it returns a vector of the same length as the data set has rows. So here what we could do is to use the scale function and apply that on the bill lengths. 
In case you don't know what scale does, well, it's, it scales the bill lengths. And by scaling, I mean that it transforms everything so that all the values are centered around zero. This means that if you have a scaled value of around zero, then you know it's a pretty average bill length. If you have something larger than zero, then that corresponding bill length is above average. And if you have it below zero, then that corresponding bill length is below average. That's what scaling helps you accomplish in a nutshell. So if you were to execute this, then you'd see that you get the bill lengths here. Notice that the name was kind of modified. There are these brackets in here now, and that's only because this scale function returns a matrix. So if you want to get the bill length without this matrix notation, then you just throw in what you see here. And if you do that, then you see that the bill length was just transformed. And to make things even more obvious, let us just select this column here so that we see only that column. Okay, so without this mutate call, these are the original bill lengths. And with the mutate call, these are the scaled bill lengths. Of course, it doesn't always make sense to overwrite the existing columns, but instead put the new transformed data into a new column. So let's call this new column scaled bill length. Let us just move this around a little bit to make it more legible. And that way, if we execute this, we see that the bill lengths are in its original state. They weren't modified. And if inside of the select call, we also throw in the new variable name, then we see that these bill lengths, these ones here, they correspond to these scaled bill lengths. And just so that you are aware of what mutate does, let us walk through what mutate does behind the scenes. If mutate gets such an instruction, if we try to execute this outside of mutate, we have to remember that we need to specify that R knows where this bill length is coming from namely from our data set and we do that via this dollar operator and then it simply executes this command and that way you get the results and these results are then stuck into the column name that you specified if the column name already exists the column is overwritten if it doesn't exist yet then this new column is created for you and the nice thing about this mutate thing is that you can put in a whole lot of instructions inside of one and the same mutate call. For example, if you wanted to create another new column, let's call it new, very original, I know. Let's just say that the new column is called new and you want to fill it with numbers like just with the number one, then what happens is that mutate will put in this new column for you. And we currently don't see it because we don't have it in select yet. But if we throw this in there, we see that our new column does exist. So really inside of mutate, you can throw in a whole lot of instructions for things to be transformed. In, in subsequent calculations, you could even refer to previous calculations. So for example, if I would now overwrite the new column that I've just created and say new is the previous value plus one, I don't know why I would do it like this, but this is just for demonstration here. You see that the new column now has the value two. So mutate is kind of neat in the way that you can break down complex transformation into small steps and throw all of these steps into the same mutate call. And one more thing that I want to mention here is that mutate really enforces that what you stick into a new column has either the length one or the original data length. So this calculation here returned a vector of length 344, just like the original data and this instruction here returned a vector of length one and mutate will understand this as meaning, okay, I will fill the whole column with the same value over and over again. But you cannot have something that isn't either one or the full length. For example, if I put in a vector with numbers one and two, mutate will say that it must be the size 344 or one and definitely not two. So that's an important limitation. In fact, it's not a limitation, it's a safety feature so that you know exactly what mutate will return. So here, let's just go with one again so that we have perfectly all right code. And if you've already watched until this point, then I can probably assume that you enjoy this video. So please do me a favor and hit the like button to tell me that you enjoy this video and I should keep making more of that. And if you do really enjoy this video, then I'm very certain that you will also enjoy my data cleaning course for which a link should pop up right about now. In this data cleaning masterclass, I show you how to take the basic fundamentals from this video and go even way further than that. 
I will show you how to do these kind of transformations efficiently, how to work with any date type that you can think of. And in particular, I will show you how to clean up Excel files or work with text data or transform times and dates, which are notoriously hard to work with. So this is really the full data cleaning package. Follow the link that should pop up right about now or follow the link that is in the description. And now let's get back to the video. The next crucial function that I want to show you is the summarize function. Let's create a new code chunk here. And then let's take our data and pass it to the summarize function. Just like a mutate, you can put in instructions inside of this function. The crucial difference to mutate is that while mutate enforces a length of one or the full length of the original data, summarize enforces that what you return in your calculation is exactly of length one. So really what summarize wants you to do is to take all of your data and reduce it to one key number. For example, what you could do is to compute the mean of the bill length and you compute this by using the mean function and sticking the bill length into this. But if you execute this, you will get an MA because there is a missing value inside of the bill lengths, as you can see here. And in that kind of case, you can simply instruct the mean function to ignore the missing values via this MA.remove argument and setting it to true. And that way you do get a summary. And just like with mutate, you can throw in more instruction into this function and that way you get even more output. And if you want to repeat this calculation for multiple subsets of your data, say for every species of the penguins that you have in your data, then you could just use the dot by argument and list the species as grouping variable. And that way you get all of these calculations for the species separately. By the way, if you have a summary like this, that at the end of the day uses the same function over and over again, then you might want to use the more advanced strategy using the across function that helps you to streamline these kind of calculations so that you don't have to do a lot of copy and pasting stuff. Again, that's an advanced trick and I just like the tidy select helpers cover that in my data cleaning masterclass. But here I just want to mention it so that you are aware of better workflows that exist that don't rely on you having to copy and paste things so that's why I'm just mentioning it here. Again, for just getting started, this is perfectly fine. Don't worry about the across function in that case. Finally, the last function I want to show you is the arrange function. It allows you to arrange the rows according to some quantity inside of your data. For example, if I wanted to sort the rows inside of my data set according to the quantity in the mean flipper length column, then I could just take my data set and pass it to the arrange function and in there, I just specify that I want to sort according to the mean flipper length. And that way, everything is sorted in ascending order. And if I wanted to use descending order, I will have to use the descending function inside of my arrange function. And that way, everything is sorted in descending order. And with that, we have covered the six fundamental building blocks for cleaning data with the tidyverse. I've tried to make this as accessible and beginner friendly as possible. Let me know in the comments if that worked. And if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure that you're going to love my data cleaning masterclass. The link for that should pop up right about now. And in any case, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.